Can we ask people to take their seats? So we'll get this panel started. If everybody would like to take their seats. My name is Fante Cornell. I'm the director of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute at the American Foreign P Policy Council. And it's a pleasure to be part of organizing this event, which mainly has, on our part, been the work of Mamuka Tseretelli, who's right there on the panel who probably doesn't need much of an introduction other than that. Uh, but I'd, I think uh, what I would like to say uh, is that uh, this panel fulfills a certain amount of abstinence. Since uh, when I first came to Washington uh, many, many years ago, there was a lot of talk about pipelines. Uh, many of you will remember that. Dr. Blank, Dr. Schaefer were all part of that back then, talking about the pipelines. Uh, our institute produced a number of studies about that back before there wasn't even a Baku Jehan pipeline, and people said it was never going to be built. Then uh, people said there would never be a pipeline from Turkmenistan to China, even while the Chinese were building it. And here we are today to talk about the new uh, landscape of pipelines in, uh, in Eurasia. And for that purpose, we have a, uh, a very uh, excellent panel. Uh, our first speaker, and I'll just, uh, uh, the introductions are in the uh, and the bios that you have. Uh, so uh, since we're running late, I will just uh, briefly introduce them. Uh, Ed Hartney is the acting director of the Office of uh, Europe, the Western Hemisphere and Africa, and the Bureau of Energy Resources at the Department of State. And since he covers a lot of continents, it's also very fitting because I think he's worked in four, if not five continents in his uh, State Department career. Uh, so that uh, I think he will be able to talk, hopefully mostly about Eurasia, but maybe about other things too. Uh, Robert Scherer is the Head of International Affairs at BP America, who uh, brings with him a long career, uh, most recently in the uh, Defense Department, as the, assist uh, as the first Assistant Secretary of Defense of the Office of Strategy, Plans, and Capabilities, uh, which is definitely something you need for building pipelines uh, and other things that you're now involved in from the other side of the, of the spectrum. So does Mamuka Tseretelli, of course, has been uh, uh, first as a, uh, as a Georgian diplomat, then as the, the founding director and president, I believe, of the, um, the uh, U.S.-Georgia Business Council, uh, or Business Development Council, is it? Business Council. Uh, and then he was for a while also the, uh, the uh, that, uh, and that's part of his business hat, which also includes the uh, importation of Georgian wine into the United States, uh, I, I, uh, I would uh, urge you to also attend the, the or to go to the new Georgian restaurant, which is about to open on 10th and M Street, is it? It's already open, it's already open. there you go. Um, and, uh, and of course, he's uh, after having uh, been the started a, a, a program on Black Sea and Caspian security uh, affairs at uh, American University, he joined our institute in 2013 and has been with the Central Asia Caucasus Institute ever since. Let me leave it at that, and I hope our speakers will um, have their brief introductions so that we can then have a discussion in the panel and with the audience. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Working uh, for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to go through uh, a little bit of an explanation of what U.S. policy is. I think that that will be useful, um, even though it'll take a little bit of time. Uh, because I think it's very important to know what our policy is on the Eurasian energy landscape. Uh, the U.S. has supported European energy security for many, many years. It's a hallmark of our transatlantic relationship since the Cold War. 
um, and Energy Secure of Europe uh, serves as a strong partner for the United States, meeting global challenges in trade and investments. We have a huge amount of trade investment, over a trillion dollars between us. And over the past three decades, our su the support has been on a bipartisan basis, going back to you know the 1990s up to the Southern Gas Corridor today. You may hear a little bit about more about that from Bob, I would suspect. Um, and but in recent years, we've worked uh, shoulder to shoulder with the uh, European partners on things such as the European Energy Union and the uh, Third Energy Package that you've already heard so much about. Um, we we want to make sure that uh, countries outside the European Union cannot use uh, their position or their resources as geopolitical weapon. Uh, our administration's energy policy is focused on three pillars. One, removing barriers to energy development and trade. Two, promoting U.S. energy exports, including resources, technology, and services. And three, and most importantly for this uh, discussion, ensuring economic and energy security for the U.S. and our allies and partners. So our policy is clear. Energy security means diversification, meaning diversification of energy sources, energy types, and energy routes. And uh, the European Union uh, shares these goals, and diversification is uh, central to U.S. support for ener European energy security. Um, and the U.S. Uh, shares widespread European concerns about projects such as that would undermine Europe's uh, diversification, such as Nord Stream 2 and a multi-line Turkish stream. We do not seek to eliminate Russian gas from the market. Russian gas can and should remain part of the diversified energy mix for Europe. We simply recognize the goal of the EU's energy union uh, to enhance energy security through new interconnections, reverse flows, and regulations to incentivize integrated markets and partnerships of new sources of natural gas. And we heard a lot about that in the, in the previous panel about how it's useful to have these small interconnector projects, not just the big pipeline projects. So um, energy security is a top priority for Europe, particularly in Southeast Europe, because many countries are dependent on a single supplier for gas imports. 13 European countries are dependent on Russian gas to meet more than 75% of their uh, annual gas imports. And we also heard in the last panel how when they are countries are dependent on Russia, their prices are much, much higher than when you go west and you have more competition. Um, as you know, energy sits at the nexus of national security and economic prosperity. Access to affordable, reliable, secure source of energy is a fundamental national security concern for every country, including the United States. Most, many European countries remember vividly in 2009 uh, and 2013 when Russia cut off gas, gas supplies to Ukraine and to Europe via Ukraine. These countries view dependence as a national security threat and are working to diversify our energy infrastructure, things like pipelines, energy, electricity grids, LNG, and nuclear facilities, all really all different types of energy. Um, and this, now I want to give some examples of how the U.S. supports European energy uh, security. Um, in the gas sector, regional projects such as the Southern Gas Corridor, which will bring Caspian gas to Europe for the first time in history. Uh, there are many other ones like Interconnector Greece-Bulgaria, Bruja, Interconnector uh, Bulgaria-Serbia. Uh, These are all fundamental to creating a single European gas market. That, that's our final goal. It allows gas to go no matter, when it, no matter where it comes from, it can circulate freely throughout Europe and meet any contingency. We're pleased with the progress in the Southern Gas Corridor including the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, which will bring the Caspian gas in. It's real diversification, a new source of gas to Europe. We also stand with the Three Seas Initiative and all the um, interconnectors to increase energy security along the north-south quarter of Central and Eastern Europe. In addition, there's infrastructure to support LNG imports, particularly in Croatia, Greece, and Southern Europe, to allow Europe to uh, import gas from anywhere in the world. Now, obviously, the U.S. has become an LNG exporter. And we believe that U.S. LNG plays an important role by helping promote more liquid, competitive, and connected markets, well-functioning gas markets, reinforce global energy security. Uh, we also, on electricity, strongly support better in interconnectivity of electricity markets. We support the Bal uh, Baltic states, so they work with the European Commission to desynchronize their grid with the European Union's electricity grid, rather than Russia, and welcome cooperation from Poland to help realize this goal. We heard before about how Poland had, had made this change, and now we're uh, hoping the Baltic states can. Um, in addition to infrastructure, we support the European Union's implementation of its own market liberalization rules and laws, including the third energy package, uh, which is helping design proper functioning of Europe's gas electricity systems. We continue to partner with European allies to support this. Um, the benefits of uh, diversification are undeniable. We already heard about when Lithuania moved from being 100% dependent on Russian gas and then they opened in 2015 a floating LNG terminal. And immediately, Gazprom had reduced the prices by 20% because they had to, to meet uh, the market. 
So, um, and, and also the U.S. cooperates with European partners and supports many of the projects the EU has identified as, quote, Project of uh, Common Interest, or PCI. There's a list of many, many projects on this that will help uh, great, uh, will greatly progress uh, European energy security through interconnections. We support these projects, even though they may have no U.S. government or private sector investment. We support them because they will support European energy security, not as a financial benefit to the United States. Um, and so, let's see. And uh, now I'd like to t move quickly to uh, Nord Stream 2 and Turkish Stream. Uh, while Europe is working to diversify its energy sector, also confronts projects that would undermine these efforts. The U.S. shares widespread European concerns about projects that would undermine um, European energy security, such as the Russia-backed Nord Stream 2 and multi-line Turkish Stream gas pipeline. We agree with many in European partners that these two projects would reinforce Russian dominance of gas markets, reduce opportunities for diversification of energy sources, and advance Russia's stated goal of ending Ukraine's role as a transit country for Russian gas exports to Europe. Uh, the, the qu sometimes people claim that Nord Stream 2 is just a commercial project, but we find that questionable. The project allows Moscow to um, exert political control in Central and Eastern Europe and Ukraine. As President Trump stated in Warsaw last summer, the United States will never use energy to coerce your nations. We cannot allow others to do so. Now, a single line of Turkish stream, that does not change the dependency of Turkey on Russia gas because they're already using Russian gas molecules. But if there's a, but it allows Russia to reduce gas transit through the Trans-Balkan line, which currently delivers gas uh, through Ukraine, Moldova, Romania, and Bulgaria. So it's the same molecules, but it would go through Turkish stream one. But if there's a multi-line Turkish stream, that combined with Nord Stream 2 would allow Gazprom a technical ability to end gas um, transit through Ukraine by the end of the decade. Now, that would be, uh, I think, a very serious issue for us because that would cut a vital link between Ukraine and the West while depriving Ukraine of up to $2 billion in annual transit revenue. So that would be a big issue for Ukraine as well. Uh, the good news is that over the past few years, assistance from the United States and others, Ukraine has taken significant steps to bolster its energy security. Again, we talked about this some in the last panel, how there have been some real, real progress. It's difficult, maybe it's two steps forward, one step back, but there are, there are pr progress being made. Thanks to uh, reverse flow agreements in Poland, Slovakia, and Hungary, Ukraine has not directly imported any Russian gas since uh, November 2015, which is a huge achievement. Um, and we, the United States is directly assisting Ukraine as it pursues its own energy security goals. We've helped them reform its energy sector, reducing corruption, while increasing government revenues. Uh, we've also helped on energy efficiency and increasing domestic gas production. Um, Nord Stream 2 and a multi-line Turkish stream would enhance Russia's and Gazprom's ability to under undermine energy security and market liberalization initiatives across the continent. So we, we welcome the efforts with, we've been working very closely with Europe on those issues and we will continue to do so. So um, that's just a quick introduction of our policy and, and thank you very much for your attention. Oh, there we go. Um, so uh, I first of all want to uh, thank all of the uh, organizations that brought this together. It's quite an, uh, it's a focused area and one that uh, obviously BP we feel very strongly about and are glad to be a part of. And looking around the room and knowing some of you and not knowing others, I suspect that there's very little I can tell you about the broad issue of the Southern Corridor Pipeline that you all don't already know. Having said that, they've asked me to speak here, so I'll do a little bit of the broad pieces, but then also get into some of the detail, if you will, of where we are now. By the way, where we are now and what I will be telling you is guaranteed to be wrong because activity is going on all the time. So as soon as I get a piece of paper that tells me what percentage we're done, it's always greater than that. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, but it also means that, I, that please don't quote on these in terms of the numbers because it's always going to be, we're making progress all the time. Um, I think as, as folks know, the Southern Gas Corridor really is an integrated gas value chain out of three clearly distinct projects, uh, arguably four, uh, depending on how you break this down. There's obviously uh, in Azerbaijan, in the Caspian, it's Shak Deniz II, the second phase of that building that up, increasing the, the amount of gas that we're able to produce, taking it then on to onshore in uh, Baku, and then the existing, the sort of expansion of the SCP pipeline that goes from Azerbaijan through into Georgia. <coughs> the next, 
there's the Trans-Anatolian Pipeline, TANAP, which goes through from Georgia through Turkey, uh, that, that whole length there. Following that, there's TAP, the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, going through from Turkey through into Greece, Albania, and Italy with a, a spur off into Bulgaria. This is a, a huge project, both from an engineering perspective as well as a political and cooperative perspective. We're looking at seven countries, 11 different shareholders, and agreements with 11 gas buyers. Um, this is, is, again, not only, uh, I would argue, a triumph of engineering, but a triumph of cooperation. And one of the things which obviously is, a, I think, a broad perspective from all of us, uh, either on technical side or government or EU, is clearly the understanding and the appreciation that we are trying to integrate this region, trying to create gas flows around so that, in fact, we can have an interconnected European gas supply where gas can flow from anywhere to anywhere and making sure that we have a broader, a redundant system and one that can cover every place that needs it free, free of other pressures from anyone else. So th this cooperation, which really I think is sort of unprecedented uh, levels, it really has been, it's from every place, from the political to the safety. And one of the things which we're very proud about is this, this has all gone on with a very good safety record, far beyond of what we would imagine uh, could happen in a project this large. Um, just to kind of give some of the stats, and then I'll get even to a little bit more details, we've got, it is a 3,500 kilometer pipeline. 500 kilometers of that is actually subsea. Um, and this will get uh, bring approximately 16 BCM of gas per annum in 2020 to Europe. Um, six of that to Turkey and, and 10 of that uh, to Europe further on. Again, to get into some of the details to make sure that I have this all right, I'm going to refer to my notes and see. Because each one of these pieces, so let's see. The project is at least 96% complete of the Shock Denise II and the SCPX. Um, we expect its first gas in 2018. And, and there's a lot of other, 13 wells have been drilled out of 26, and that's all enough to deliver first gas. So making great progress on that first part. Uh, TANAP, um, so we've had construction of the 56 inch pipeline uh, is necessary for first gas to Turkey, and we have construction across all three sections. Also, f neglected to mention that in Georgia, I think we have both, we have the compressor station going through testing right now, the first one, uh, is my understanding. So we are in, in good shape through all that. Um, this is already 1,600 kilometers of pipe has been welded, uh, probably 15 kilometers lowered in, and over 1,000 hydro tested to date. Um, Again, 2018, uh, Turkey should receive six BCM of Shock Denise gas. Um, as you look more, it, there's also the very important piece, and I think the one that's gotten a lot of the focus is the tap going into landing finally in Italy. Um, we have made progress. There is still work to be done. It is obviously the last stage of this, and we're looking to get first gas in 2020. Uh, and for those of you familiar with olive trees, yes, we have removed olive trees. This is, this is important. We have some permitting and still some permitting to go, but we're doing, uh, we've really focused on making sure that we have that license to operate, not just of the permitting, but the license to operate from the people in Italy and the local communities there, and, and we feel we're making good progress. As even though TAP is the by far the smallest piece of the pipeline, uh, it is obviously one of the most important ones as well. And so our focus continues to be on how can we can make sure to working with all of the stakeholders to deliver gas to Europe and integrate it into a more the Western European pipelines that we see in you know, starting in Italy. Um, I'm actually going to stop there since we've uh, talked about more and there, there's certainly more technical detail that you could ask and that I probably will not be able to answer uh, because I'm in Washington, not on the ground doing that. But I look forward to talking more broadly about this and the importance of the project as other people see it as well. Um, but from certainly from a BP perspective, this is one that we're very proud of in terms of the bringing uh, everyone together 
of being able to operate this and build this safely and being able to contribute to the EU's clear understanding of how they look to increase energy security as well as fitting, I think, well within U.S. policy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to probably start with the kind of main uh, point of my, <coughs> my presentation today. That is that in order to um, solve uh, long-term um, energy security problem and natural gas supply problem for uh, Black Sea uh, area and Eastern, some of the countries of Eastern Europe, I think a key would be uh, to develop uh, an advanced uh, energy connectivity between Black Sea and Caspian uh, Sea uh, areas and resources of, of Caspian uh, to, to to be delivered to, to the Black Sea countries, Ukraine, as well as other countries in, in, a, uh, in a Black Sea area. And uh, that actually builds on um, Bob's uh, presentation. This project, obviously, it cannot be, the importance of this project cannot be exaggerated. It will be the first connection of Caspian resources directly uh, to European markets uh, with a dedicated uh, infrastructure and, and with a potential to to expand and uh, and uh, cover uh, even more, I mean, deliver even more natural gas from from resources in the Caspian region to European markets. So this is huge progress built on uh, other um, developments that were that have emer emerged in, in 90s and in 2000s, where collaboration between uh, producer countries, Azerbaijan and transit countries, Georgia and Turkey. And with the great facilitation of the United States at that point, uh, brought this possibility of, of uh, first to develop early oil pipelines connecting Black Sea and Caspian Sea between Baku and Supsa, and then uh, to, to develop Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline, which was actually the kind of uh, uh, turning point in, in uh, energy development, energy security uh, for for entire region. That and we. We were discussing this in the previous panel. That collaboration allowed for countries to come together and be uh, much closer to each other, build a strategic partnership, but also to be connected to the uh, European and world energy markets as well, and thus also uh, uh, become uh, global actors in, 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 uh, in global economic actors. Uh, going back to my earlier kind of initial point that uh, what I would like to see is really uh, greater uh, Caspian Black Sea energy connectivity. Uh, with all the pipelines that the United States supported in the 90s, uh, and those were Baku Tbilisi Jehan, so called ma major oil pipeline at that point, uh, early oil pipeline, uh, pipeline that connects uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, Tengiz Field to uh, to Black Sea via Russia. At that, po at that time, that was also a priority project for U.S. government as well, uh, pipeline that uh, serves Chevron's production needs and export needs. Uh, there was one pipeline was that was never developed and built, which is Trans-Caspian Pipeline. And this is the pipeline that's supposed to bring, bring Turkmen gas to, uh, to uh, first to South Caucasus and, and Turkey and then to European markets. And um, in a sense, that's what is missing today in this picture of, uh, of uh, energy security for uh, particular Eastern European countries. Uh, just to remind you, I just looked today at Gazprom uh, website. And uh, they have a uh, record year in terms of sales of natural gas to Europe this year. And uh, uh, last year, they sold 25 billion cubic meters of natural gas to Turkish market. Today, I mean, this year they're expecting 22% growth and uh, about the same percentage growth of sales of natural gas from Russia to, to Europe. With all the talks about, obviously, important role that LNG, US LNG and other LNG uh, plays in the European market, let's be realistic. Countries in Ukraine, Moldova, Hungary, Slovakia, other countries, Serbia, will not have uh, much alternatives for Russian gas anytime soon. So, uh, and unless we think about some kind of strategic solution of this problem, I think we'll be facing this issue 
down the road all the time because we don't none of us expects that Russia will change its 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 uh, model of behavior anytime soon so uh, and by the way if you look at the pattern of Russian behavior it's 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 obvious that whenever they can stop developments they will try to stop it if it happens that's let's say infra infrastructure develops they will try to intervene with the price competition or other kind of maybe corruption or other issues that they could uh, other other tools they could uh, use in in the in uh, in the that that are in large numbers in their arsenal so i think uh, uh, that's that uh, that uh, understanding is important for us to uh, continue our thinking about how can we resolve long-term strategic challenge of, of having natural gas supply coming to uh, particularly in these Eastern European countries that need the, that gas, particularly in Ukraine. So my, uh, um, it's not again new idea, it's very old idea that never actually materialized, but it won't happen without uh, greater connectivity of Turkmen resources to Azerbaijan, to Georgia, Turkey, and, uh, and then to markets. So I think uh, the development of TANAP is building this basis of where this infrastructure could serve not only purpose of shipping existing uh, natural, natural gas uh, that will be uh, uh, produced in, um, in, um, in uh, Azerbaijan, Shah Denis too, but also to take some of the natural gas coming from Turkmenistan and add to this, uh, uh, to, uh, and, and use the existing infrastructure to establish precedent of shipping Turkmen gas to European markets directly uh, to the consumers. You know, we all know that there are, uh, there are several ingredients um, that needs to be in place for major commercial developments to take place. It requires market, it requires resources, and it requires infrastructure that connect these two together. And I think this, uh, this currently developing, rapidly developing infrastructure project uh, related to Shah uh, resources uh, is creating this kind of opportunity for smaller scale initially uh, shipments of natural gas uh, to, to European markets, but key obviously will be to find the ways to use resources of Turkmenistan for supplies of, uh, uh, and, uh, to, to European markets. And that will require, in my view, and probably most of people will agree with that, is that that will probably require either expansion of existing infrastructure down the road in 10 years from now or five, seven years from now, or uh, development of the another dedicated infrastructure uh, element that will cross uh, from Caspian to uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and beyond. Uh, but this will not happen unless, uh, unless there is a uh, political security solution for uh, this type of decision by the producing, major producing country, uh, which is Turkmenistan. And uh, when we analyze reasons why uh, Trans-Caspian pipeline was never developed, I think we should uh, mention that one of the reasons is that uh, uh, at the right time, at the right moment, uh, Russian Federation as a literal state of Caspian Sea introduced this challenge of uh, the limitation of borders in the Caspian Sea, that was one uh, important element in this, in this, and 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 facilitation or 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 um, igni ignition of of uh, some some tensions between Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan at that point. We are talking about the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, so Russian factor will remain as an important factor in 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 this consideration, and without some kind of. Uh, Without ways of addressing this pro uh, this issue, uh, this uh, this development will not take place. So, what are the ways of addressing uh, this issue? We had this discussion earlier today that you know some uh, countries are <coughs> becoming members of energy community and, and so forth, and they are asked to comply to certain rules. Uh, but for whatever reasons, European Union is not asking Russia or demanding from Russia to use the same. Uh, or apply the same rules of game uh, when it relates to export of Russian uh, gas or, or access of third parties to their pipelines and so forth. 
So I think there is a one missing, huge, important um, missing element in uh, in relationship between uh, in this in this picture of natural gas uh, pipeline development going forward. European Union is getting tremendous leverage by having truck stream ga gas at some point going to European Union as well as Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. Germany is becoming very, very important and powerful transit country for Russian gas. And Germany will have a tremendous leverage if it decides to use it on, on Russia as well. In a sense, German may, Germany may become not in the full scale Ukrainian sort of scale of, of transit country, but it will be, if both pipelines are completed, Nord Streams, and if they are fully utilized, we are talking about 110 billion cubic meters of natural gas. So it's a huge transit capacity. So, and this is a, not only economic leverage, but obviously it's political leverage as well. Plus we need to think about, you know, European Union actually accepted the reality that, that by building these pipelines, bypassing Ukraine, Ukraine is losing this very important uh, stream of revenue. It, this is expected to be $3 billion this year, transit fees, which is, I think, 3% or some close to 3% of GDP. So we are talking about very significant uh, negative impact of, of, of this bypass, unless it's somehow turned into some kind of benefit. And benefit would be if, if there is a some kind of Agreement. I know that it's very hard to achieve, and it's, it looks like maybe or sounds like very, uh, very wishful thinking sort of an, an, an utopian idea. But uh, in order for Russia to have access, full access to European markets uh, under those those uh, terms of and the rules of um, uh, rules of the game, Russia should allow, and that is important point, should allow Transcaspian pipeline to develop into. Um, to serve as a, as a basis for uh, increased energy security for Eastern European countries. So I'll stop here. Um, before we, um, while the audience is collecting their thoughts, um, let me ask Mr. Hartney, you focus very much on Western Europe and within the EU, um, but as we remember from 10, 15 years ago, the uh, support of the United States was uh, crucial for the building of the infrastructure from the east, from the Caspian region that made possible the type of diversification that you were talking about in your, in your remarks. So I think a lot of us would like to know uh, to what extent you are thinking about and what the United States is doing to support the uh, development of additional or addition of Caspian energy resources, among other, to the European market and particularly in connection with what uh, Mamuka was talking about. Uh, we have uh, Central Asian states today that are pretty much, I would say, in the position that Azerbaijan and Georgia were in the mid-1990s. Should we take the step, should we take the plunge and take the risk of agreeing with uh, to export our energy westward, which would ruffle some feathers in some quarters in the north? Uh, but the correlation of forces at that time suggested that it was worth the risk and that was a one it, it's been a tremendous payoff uh, both for the region and for Europe. Um, is anything being done now to suggest for Kazakh decision makers or Turkmen decision makers that there is some political support from Western countries uh, if they decide to do the same thing, i.e. to to uh, to decide to export their especially gas resources, but also Kashagan oil resources westward. Uh, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to to point out that we we have we were we've been working for many years to try to bring the uh, Southern Gas Corridor to fruition, and it has support from this administration as well. Um, both President Trump and also Secretary Tillerson have written letters, which have been read at Baku Energy Conferences, uh, supporting the Southern Gas Corridor. Um, as for the Transcaspian Pipeline. That's something that has been out and considered for a long time, and the U.S., I, I think, has supported and, and talked about it for a long time. But there have been a lot of issues of actually bringing it to fruition. Uh, I think that with Turkmenistan trying to make decisions uh, of what uh, is necessary to actually get that um, 
project moving forward, um, including some of the border issues that have been discussed. Um, and you also, I think, we've mentioned Kazakhstan and other sources of gas. In general, as I said, we are very broadly supportive of European energy diversification. And if there was some way to bring those sources of energy uh, in an efficient marketable way, I think we would support that. Uh, we have, um, and, and we are certainly talking to Kazakhstan, we're talking to Turkmenistan, and seeing ways that they can um, further exploit their gas resources to try to bring more energy diversification to Europe and also just to uh, strengthen their own economies. Is there a, is, is there a um, do, you, do you view the Trans-Afghan Pipeline Project and the Trans-Caspian as complementary with each other, or is there a slight difference between, should we say, European priorities and U.S. priorities? And is there a way, and if so, is there a way to square that circle? Well, I, I actually did serve in Afghanistan, um, was it 2012 to 2013, and there was a lot of talk about TAPI and bringing uh, Turkmen gas, uh, I believe, t uh, eventually to, to India. And, um, you know, there, you're, you're going through a, a war zone. It's very, very difficult uh, to do that. It's certainly a project that we supported and we, we've tried to push forward, but it, it, it has been very, very difficult to move that forward. Um, I, I think I'd have to look at the gas export potential to see whether they could do both, but I, I think we'd be happy if they could move to forward one to try to increase their, um, their, their markets and, and their potential for exporting gas. Any reactions from um, the two of you on this issue? Uh, the, the technical perspective, we all know there are great resources elsewhere in the Caspian, that it's not just in places that are specific within Azerbaijan. Uh, and certainly, uh, I think any, uh, you know, any, any of the, the companies is looking to try to figure out if there are other resources to be exploited, if that can be done on a commercially viable basis. Uh, but obviously, um, it has not just to be commercially viable, but politically viable. So uh, we, we'll, we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing how that works out. I would say is that <coughs> uh, we cannot skip uh, mentioning one big actor in this conversation, which is China, that is already importing substantial amount of, it's actually only export market right now for, uh, only significant export market for uh, Turkmen gas. But also uh, China is obviously looking for greater trade connectivity between Caspian and Black Sea. And, uh, and going forward, you know, depending on obviously where U.S. policy will stand in terms of Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative because there is no, no, no certainty where, where whether going forward the U.S. will be very supportive to this project or will be passive observer or will be negative sort of attitude to that. But the, depending on where, where these relationships will go, China may be, uh, strangely enough, there is a scenario where China may play a very constructive role actually in the process of exporting Turkmen gas to uh, to 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 west uh, to westward, if China has some benefit out of it, obviously, otherwise there is no no way China will do it. By the way, I, th I wanted to mention as well. Some of you may know, some of you may not know that China is becoming actor in everywhere in the world, including Eastern Europe, including Black Sea, these three C initiatives. China has its own version of it, which is 16 plus one initiative, which is the already formally organized entity of, of countries that gathers every year. They have summits. Last summit was in Riga, I believe, in last year, where Eastern European countries, both members of EU and NATO, as well as non-members, are gathered together and they discuss issues of mutual cooperation and, and partnership. So China is an actor and that's, we cannot disregard that. Thank you. Um, the floor is open. Uh, who would like to start? Dr. Blank, I see your hand. Do we have my, yes, we have microphones. Uh, thank you, Stephen Blank, American Foreign Policy Council. Uh, my question is directed specifically to Mr. Hartney, but if other members of the uh, panel w want to uh, op uh, uh, speak on it, that'd be fine too. Uh, you said that uh, if Turkstream is built and it's a single pipeline, that it really wouldn't change the situation because Turkey is already importing a lot of its, about two thirds of its gas from Russia, which is true. But isn't this also an attempt to evade Ukraine and European Union rules by selling the gas to Turkey and then uh, shipping it to Europe uh, so that Moscow could evade European Union? Second, there are enormous gas deposits that have been discovered already 
in the Eastern Mediterranean, off of Cyprus, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt, plus other existing sources in the Middle East. What thinking is there in the administration about trying to take advantage of the situation to bring gas from the Eastern Mediterranean and more gas, if possible, from the Middle East into Europe through these networks of pipelines that can and uh, be built? Thank you. Um, let's see. First of all, on, um, on Turkish Stream Line 1, um, yes, it, it would be the same. Right now, that's going through Ukraine, the Trans-Balkan Lines, and it would, be, it would deprive uh, Ukraine of some transit revenue if, if instead you have Turkish Stream. Uh, I, I think we've looked at it from a geopolitical standpoint, and also Turkey is very strong in, in wanting to, to have Turkish Stream 1. So I, I, I think I see, understand your concerns, but our focus is going to be opposing Turkish Stream 2. Um, I think that it depends where Turkish Stream makes a landfall and what possible EU rules would apply to Turkish Stream. But if it's just between uh, Russia and, and Turkey, it's harder to apply uh, some of those uh, rules. Um, as for Eastern Med, um, yes, there is amazing, uh, there's a lot of potential there. Uh, we certainly support um, exporting uh, that and, and developing that gas, those gas supplies and exporting them to Europe or other places. We, we think that um, because of Eastern Med, it could potentially bring, help bring, uh, encourage peace and cooperation between the countries that have those gas supplies. So we're very supportive of it, and we're working with uh, all of those countries to try to figure out ways that you can economically viably and politically viably, it's, it takes both, to try to get those, that gas uh, supplies developed and brought to Europe. Any other? No? Further? Hi, thanks. It's Emily Meredith with Energy Intelligence. And my question's for Mr. Scher. Um, so you mentioned about you know being very supportive of gas coming s from anywhere, going to anywhere um, in your remarks. With the, expan the potential expansion of TAP, is there a chance for Russian gas to go through that expanded future um, future project? And then sort of relatedly, you know, how are the financing costs, um, financing issues that SOCAR is dealing with um, affecting Azeri supply? So uh, in terms of the first question, that's not something we're really looking at right now. Uh, um, obviously, you know, we, we understand the potential for that. But right now, really, the focus is on the on getting that uh, the f everything up and running and living up to the commitments uh, for that pipeline that we've made to the 11 buyers uh, around. And so that's that's the focus of the effort in terms of, of the, pi the tap right now. Um, in terms of, sorry, your second question was, uh, yeah. Um, I think uh, right now, uh, everything, you know, we, we always watch all these events, but I think uh, we, we feel pretty comfortable. We have a long relationship with SOCAR. Uh, we, uh, so far, I have not heard of anything uh, that has, um, that is a, a concern beyond what we would normally be concerned and frankly something that would affect the production or the engineering or any of the other pieces of this at this point. Yes, sir. And then the gentleman right behind you. Thank you. Uh, Vlad Muzilov, uh, Embassy of Ukraine. So we uh, fully share State Department's position regarding North Stream truth. So it's absolutely clear that it's not uh, like a business project, but more uh, geostrategic projects. So they are trying to increase their influence on uh, uh, on Europe. So, but uh, at, at the same time. Uh, what is uh, what is the question? So uh, on August second, uh, President Trump signed and um, countering uh, America's adversaries through sanctions act. And uh, according to that ad, the uh, State Department has uh, a huge uh, tools to fight against this project. Actually, it's possible to implement sanctions ag uh, against uh, Russian export pipelines. So. Um I would uh, be glad if you can provide some information on that. What are you, are you going to <coughs> implement uh, these uh, provisions of the law regarding North Stream 2? So thank you. 
Thank you. I am glad that we agree on, the, on the, our characterization of Nord Stream uh, 2. Um, as you know, the, the U.S. has already had sanctions on Russia because of failure to implement Minsk uh, agreement and uh, not withdrawing from Crimea and also some of the cyber attacks and other things. Um, and, the, uh, and then uh, Congress passed and President Trump signed into law additional Russia sanctions, including uh, Section 232, which is the section that uh, uh, covers uh, energy pipelines. It's a discretionary uh, law. Um, I'm not going to comment on specific cases. We just published um, public guidance uh, late last week um, that, that I think is very clear, and companies can, can look at it and can decide uh, whether this or that pipeline um, falls under the uh, potential sanction. Um, we will work with our – one of the things that we do is that we they, – a lot of work in our agency and also with our allies, both going to Europe and also uh, they came here to talk to us repeatedly about um, – this bill and, and, and the possible public guidance and potential issues. So we worked very, very hard to make sure that we, we got it right. Um, we, our policy, our sanctions policy is very carefully calibrated to incentivize Russia to uphold its men's commitments and withdraw from Crimea um, and stop cybersecurity attacks, but also not to hinder or um, have unintended consequences against our allies. Um, as I said earlier, we very strongly do support, uh, we, we share Europe's concerns about Nord Stream 2. We continue to work with uh, Ukraine and, and many other partners on these issues uh, because both of it reinforces Russia's gas dominance and also would hurt your country by depriving it of uh, gas revenue. Gentleman right back. Hi, Shai Franklin with your global strategy. One country that hasn't been mentioned in this conversation is Iran, and I'd appreciate if you could fit it into the context, certainly in terms of Azerbaijan and Russia, but uh, other considerations, including Middle East energy resources, transit routes, and the, uh, of course, geostrategic considerations. a quick and easy uh, piece just to make sure everyone is aware that in the Shakhtanis project, uh, it is a 10% is the Iranian oil company. Uh, so um, that has been from the very beginning of all this. And, uh, and you know, so from a technical aspect, they are, they are involved, if you will, um, in, in the project. It is also one of the reasons why this project has had to seek to have exemptions uh, in law previously so that it can continue because of that the cooperation, but obviously geography uh, is important when it comes to these things, as you've noted, and uh, they are a partner in, in the Shock Denise II project. Maybe I'll just add that um, obviously the administration has grave concerns about Iran, uh, some of its behavior, um, and also about the JCPOA uh, agreement. So um, we are uh, reviewing our, our policy, and uh, I, I think that's something you have to stay tuned about but uh, we're certainly not encouraging additional uh, Iranian exports uh, through these sites. Certainly that <coughs> some new dynamics is emerging in the, in, uh, in the area with the developments in Saudi Arabia uh, and changes in the government and in the, in the leadership and so forth. Uh, it is obvious that there will be uh, continuation of this, uh, even maybe more escalation of, of, of proxy wars between Saudi Arabia and Iran and uh, under, under, the, under the current kind of geopolitical circumstances, it's very hard to see any role Iran can play in, uh, in the supply of natural gas to, uh, to Europe in the, in the long term or even in, even in the regional projects uh, that, are, um, that are under consideration. Uh, you, you probably know that Iran is playing some role in, in supply of natural gas to Armenia from time to time, but even that role is very limited because Russia is obviously not interested Iran to play any role in in uh, in, uh, in the markets that that Russia dominates, so in a sense Iran is facing uh, not only challenge of dealing with the geopolitical realities with the United States and other actors, but also with the Russia because there are certain areas where where Iran, I mean Russia, doesn't want Iran to go, obviously. So. Yes, sir. At the back. Kemal Kirishchi from Brookings. I have a question to Robert Sher. You, you fascinatingly refer to this project 
from uh, Azerbaijan going all the way to Europe as a triumph of engineering and cooperation. Looking way into the future, do you see the players in that project and the financiers uh, adopting a similar cooperative attitude towards gas from northern Iraq? Even, uh, even in my previous job, where I was uh, looked to to make some predictions, uh, I was uh, I, I disliked that intensely, knowing that uh, we are consistently bad at predicting the future. What I will say is, I think we have some evidence to suggest that some of the previous, some of the pipelines, some of the oil pipelines that we had before, built up patterns of cooperation that were very useful as we look to build the Southern Corridor gas pipeline. In fact, I think there were many people who were sh surprised that it worked quite as well as it did. And in those patterns of cooperation, I think, uh, are very powerful. Does that mean that they will, uh, just because they helped transitioning in terms of building this new pipeline, that we could see it elsewhere? I don't know, but I certainly, and, and I don't also want to oversell um, what it means to do a technical and business deal, if you will, in terms of broader political, uh, geopolitical cooperation. But I also don't think, I think we have evidence to suggest that we shouldn't undersell that either, mm -hmm. and that this is an important piece of that. So I, I would hope so, depending on how that would work. But again, that there, are a lot of, there are a lot of different pieces in all of that. Um, but you know, um, I'm going to stick to not trying to predict the future, because I'm almost sure I'm going to be wrong almost all the time. Since, since the issue of northern Iraq was raised, um, uh, perhaps our panel could um, speak to the uh, recent growing involvement of Russian companies in a territory for which the United States has indirectly or directly provided security in the past over 20 years. And uh, what, if anything, is um, the attitude of the administration towards this? This is a, a very recent development of, of Rosneft uh, taking over some of the, uh, the pipelines. Uh, it is something that we're following very closely and that we certainly are, are, are concerned about. Um, it, it increases um, Russia's uh, kind of control of, of that area of gas supplies in that area, including to, to Turkey. So I, I, I don't think I can roll out an administration policy on this, but I can certainly say that it's something that we're concerned about and we're following very closely. Further, I think we had some hands on the other side that were raised, no? Uh, good afternoon. <coughs> Sorry, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Bugar Gorbanov from Azerbaijan. I would like to thank all the speakers for supporting Southern Gas Corridor. Uh, obviously, United States was um, one of the main partners in moving forward this project. Uh, BP, who was one of the practical implementers, and uh, Mamuka and Central Asia Caucasus Association, who one of the intellectually supporting this endeavor. I, I had a question on, the, uh, on a topic which my Ukrainian colleague mentioned, and we, we know about this uh, energy uh, sanctions, and one of which, a part of which is uh, on energy. And I, I took note of the uh, answer about not commenting on a specifics or a specific project. That's why I will modify my question and don't put in the specifics, but a general question. How do you see in five years the energy outlook of Europe? I mean, do you see Nord Stream 2, Turkish Stream, Southern Gas Corridor, US LNG, or you know, northern Iraq. I mean, what would be the shares of all these projects, if any of them? And thank you for commenting. I, and this question is for for all speakers. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I, I have to echo uh, what Bob said about predictions. And I, I think that this we're, we have quite a few predictions that all work together. And so the chances of us um, being correct is, is, is probably fairly low. But I would, I, I'd make a few um, observations on what I think uh, might happen. 
One is that Nord Stream 2 is not inevitable. A lot of people say that it is, but in fact, it still has to get all of its regulatory approvals. Um, there are also uh, issues of um, the European uh, Union and uh, looking at uh, either amending its gas directive or, um, or getting a mandate, so applying the third energy package to, uh, to Nord Stream 2. Um, and also uh, Denmark, as uh, their legislators, looking at, um, I think, I I think they've actually either are about to pass or have passed legislation that they can consider these pipeline projects on national security grounds. So I, I would not say that that's inevitable that you'll have that built. Um, Turkish Stream uh, is is actually under construction right now, so I think it's it's more difficult to stop. Uh, quite frankly, um, it it is not completed. Things can get canceled. Look at South Stream, but but that that's going to be more difficult. Um, I do think that you will have. Uh, um, continued reforms in Ukraine, and that, and that will help. I, I think that Ukraine can have a viable um, uh, system to, to bring, uh, continue to bring Russian gas um, in, into to Europe. Uh, you have other sources of gas. It could be Eastern Med, although that's going to take a while, probably longer than five years. You have a project called Baltic Pipe, which is uh, to bring um, Norwegian gas to Poland, so that, that's another source. And I, I wouldn't underestimate um, LNG, not just U.S. LNG, but all LNG. It provides a lot of liquidity to the market, and there are a number of LNG facilities either that are built or some are planned, and uh, they, they can have a tremendous impact on, um, uh, on the market, as happened in Lithuania. Now I'll pass to Bob. I think uh, um, since you've stolen my line, I'll, I'll, I'll let you do that. <laughs> no, um, I, I think the one thing which I would add to all of this is that I, we, we should not forget that the increase in demand for gas overall is a good thing for sustainable energy and for clean energy. And that is why I think we're seeing a lot of that. And that's something that uh, I think uh, BP, I know certainly, and other uh, majors uh, are looking at is understanding that there's going to be increased demand for gas as countries in Europe and all over the world look to turn to uh, more sustainable energy and clean energy production um, for the timing. So it's hard to imagine that you won't see more opportunities for that uh, and that, frankly, we should welcome that. And that is a good thing uh, overall as we transition uh, through the fossil fuel, uh, you know, through, through different fossil fuels into more sustainable energy production. I would say that uh, mm, uh, Turkstream is definitely uh, going to be constructed. I think Nord Stream 2 will be constructed as well. But I also think that uh, there is a great chance that uh, some of the gas an existing from existing TANAP may go to via reversed pipeline, trans Balkan pipeline that comes from now via Ukraine to Romania and Bulgaria to Turkey. That pipeline can take gas from TANAP to the north and take it to the Eastern European countries. And that's something that we need to think about and focus on uh, because only language Russian Gazprom and Russian leadership will understand if you take proactive position because with the passive and positions that we have right now and follow what are the developments emerging there and then somehow try to respond or prevent that, it's not gonna work. Let's take proactive steps if it makes business sense, of course, because there's no way something like that could take place uh, without without um, having some commercial merits. But looking at uh, aggregate demand in Ukraine and neighboring countries uh, and how much they pay now for, for Russian gas, if reversing pi that pipeline and taking gas from, from, uh, from TANAP or maybe some uh, additional line of TANAP can make sense. If I may just follow up on, on the uh, on the uh, Steve's uh, earlier point on the on the access to um, to EU market, no, ultimately this pipeline will enter. I mean, this gas will enter in EU territory. So that's again job of European Union to manage this in a way that that benefits uh, not only EU member countries but EU interests in general, which is also. Let's hope it still exists, shared Western interests. Thank you. At the next conference on this, maybe we can invite some German representatives to uh, elucidate us about their thinking, unless we have some in the room. Um, if not, uh, are any further? We have time for probably one or two more interventions. Uh, 
Jehim from Azerbaijan. I was doing research at George Washington University. And uh, Mamuka made a very interesting point regarding the Chinese interest in the region. And maybe just as, a, as an additional to what you said, Svante, that maybe you can have some Chinese experts here that they can we can see what they are talking about, what they are thinking, because I feel like it's a, it's a gap in this, in this picture. And um, my question is that uh, a couple of days ago, I was in a different um, you know, event like this, and there are like recommendations was one of the recommenders. Uh, the panelist was making a recommendation, and he made a concern that there is no U.S. Um, strategy, clear U.S. strategy in the in the Eurasian region. But uh, if we look at Russia and China and maybe Iran and other regional actors, they have it. So, um, do you agree with that statement, or um, there is some strategy, or it's hidden and it's never clear, or um, you know what's what is that people are from the region in Eurasia and the Caucasus and Central Asia, especially, we are like, they are concerned about this. What is, wh why it's like this? I can just add to that. That's something we get very frequently when we talk with people in government positions or non-government positions. Where is the United States um, uh, now, especially after a change of administration, I think this is Truly a question on the, uh, uh, in, in the minds of many people across the region. Is there a U.S. strategy and what is it? We have to add some oil to the, or fuel into this. <laughs> 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 Maybe gas, yes. So, uh, in a sense, this, is, this somehow resonates to your question about, uh, about earlier about Iraq and northern Iran. You know, U.S. invested so much time and resources into development, let's say this southern gas corridor and this uh, earlier pipelines and and uh, and strengthening sovereignty of Central Asia countries and South Caucasus countries, and like, I mean, U.S. by default, in a sense, ser s served as a provider of public goods in Afghanistan as well because security in Afghanistan was very helpful to Russians, to Chinese, and many others. But when it came to the con contracts for for businesses, all those contracts went to Chinese and Russian and other companies in many other places. So I think, uh, but because I think it's a reflection of some of the recent developments of recent years, uh, not necessarily last year, but in the last maybe 10 years. So uh, I think this is essential that we utilize all those, we benefit out of investments that we made rather than others benefit out of those, those investments. And this is, this is my, my comment. Yeah. Yeah, um, hey Bob, anything more? Are you gonna? <laughs> 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 oh, good, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd make, I, I would say, of course, that we do have a U.S. policy. Um, we, I ex outlined it, which is to support European energy security. We work with the Europeans on that, and we are looking at a, a huge number of diversification projects. Um, when President Trump was at the Three Seas Initiative, he talked about it and uh, how we're against energy coercion, and he named a couple of projects, such as the Kirk Island LNG uh, facility that we specifically supported. Um, we've taken a lot of support for over the years for um, Southern Gas Quarter, including recently with President Trump and um, Secretary Tillerson. Um, and uh, so, so we have been very active, I, I, I think, in that. Um, we are in, uh, we are working, coordinating even now. For example, um, I'm here because um, my, the, the acting head of the Bureau is in Europe working um, on issues, and also my boss is in Europe working on issues. So we are very active actually going around and doing things. Um, and I, I think that um, it, it, it's easy, quite frankly, from the outside to say, hey, why don't you bring the, build the Trans-Caspian Pipeline, or why don't you do this? These are very difficult things because you have to see whether they're economically viable and whether they're politically viable to see if they're going to go forward. It's, it's a lot easier to kind of look at the map and point at lines than actually have things come through. Um, and then uh, the last thing I would say is about Afghanistan. Um, yes, we did uh, obviously had a huge amount of effort in Afghanistan to try to make it uh, safer, and we did a lot of work to try to encourage businesses. Um, we encouraged uh, U.S. businesses to come in. Uh, we have a free market model, so we can't tell the businesses to come in. It's up to them whether, whether they do. Um, and I know that a number of companies, such as Chinese companies, came in and for various minerals. And, and, I, and Afghanistan has quite a bit of um, uh, potential in terms of extractives. But my understanding is that uh, not much has happened on it because of the uh, security situation. So um, we, 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 uh, we tried to get U.S. companies to come in. 
Not that many did, but I, I, I don't know that they're really regretting it right now. In, in part because this is true and in part um, from my previous colleagues, um, uh, you are in terms of um, the sanctions, uh, the most recent sanctions law, I just want to make sure that everyone here knows and commend the State Department for working very closely with Europeans and our allies and that that was uh, part of the legislation that was worked very hard uh, by, by folks, I'm told, to make sure that we could retain the, uh, the consonance between the regimes and from the commercial side, it's very important that we have as much consonance in that, the, the regime. And so working very closely with European countries and neighbors, and, and uh, it's, it's actually a, a remarkable thing that the, and the State Department didn't have to do it, and it is sort of understaffed right now. So the amount of time that the State Department and Treasury have spent coordinating these sanctions, making sure that they are um, consistent across uh, everything is hugely important for the commercial sector so that we don't have to feel like we're operating in multiple different areas and multiple different perspectives. And, and the State Department deserves tremendous credit for that. Yeah, thank you, I, I just add that um, we, unity uh, is very important because if there are different types of sanctions for European countries versus U.S. companies, it will be exploited. So we have, to, we have worked very, very hard to maintain unity. Uh, Congress asked us to do that in the most recent Russia sanctions bill, and uh, we have done that. We have gone out, fanned out through Europe. Europeans have certainly come here. We've worked through the private sector also, so we are working very hard to maintain this unity because that's essential for success. We have probably time for one last question. Professor Schaefer. Uh, one comment and one uh, question. So in the comment, I think we should be thinking about intra-Caspian pipeline and not trans-Caspian because essentially what's much more commercially and maybe even politically easier is to link uh, 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 sectors within the Caspian versus actually connecting the, the, la the lands of the two, the two countries. Um, the question, the question would be to Mr. Scher, you've talked about the uh, advancement in the field, not just the idea of the southern gas corridor, but actually the progress. And in fact, I think you've even had testing, the first testing of gas in between Azerbaijan and Georgia. And BP made a decision in September, announced a decision in September to uh, extend the PSAs with Azerbaijan to, to 2048. So with extended uh, investment of BP in Azerbaijan and in the Caspian and presence, is it time for us to start thinking about uh, southern gas corridor phase two um, and that which would also maybe perhaps include uh, Central Asian gas, Shah uh, Deniz phase three, additional fields in Azerbaijan like the Indies and uh, Afsharon, uh, potentially East Med gas, as Professor Blank mentioned fr from Israel, and reach new markets in Europe su such as the, the Balkans. You noted the fact that we uh, have longer term relationships in place now across um, both the oil and the gas sector in Azerbaijan does uh, allow us, I think, to think about um, longer-term investments as well. And uh, that's, I, I, you know, those are things that we'll have to take a look at in terms of commercial viability and then cooperation with our partners. But uh, I assure you, you know, right now, um, I think the focus is making sure that we can deliver what we have agreed to and what our buyers uh, expect of us from Shock Denise II. Uh, and making sure that we don't take for granted the progress and the good work that has been done and the safety record that we've been able to maintain and, uh, and that there are more olive trees potentially that we'll need to take care of in, in Italy where this lands. Uh, but certainly um, we are always open to uh, opportunities if they are commercially viable and we believe that there is a cooperation and you know, that we can get from all of the stakeholders in this and we'll have to take a look at that, but if the but the long-term uh, relationship is something that's very important between us and Azerbaijan, it's something that we, and SOCAR as well, and something that we think is very valuable and has been very valuable, I think, to the region and, and commercially for a long time. Thank you, if there is any last word from our panelists, I'd let them have a last word. If not, I think we will break here. Thank you very much. Thank you for the audience, for your participation.
Uh, just a quick word of housekeeping. Uh, lunch is outside in the room directly behind you. We'll be coming back at 1245 for our third panel. So we urge everybody to get their food and, and uh, eat it as quickly and come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.